This beautifully crafted, ornate, fourth century goblet is called the Lysurgus Cup. And it's the earliest known example of the implementation of nanotechnology. How is this using nanotechnology? Well, you'll notice in these images on the screen that the cup displays itself in a series of striking color schemes. Under normal light, it appears opaque green. <clears throat> but when light passes through it from behind, it suddenly glows a rich, vibrant red. Now, this effect is called dichroism, but it's not just artistic, it's highly scientific. Modern analysis of this cup, which is currently being housed in the British Museum in London, revealed that whoever was responsible for creating this cup had somehow suspended nanoscale particles of gold and silver about 50 to 100 nanometers wide within the glass matrix. These nanoparticles interact with light in complex ways and create something called surface plasmon resonance. The scattering and the absorbing of different wavelengths depending on how the light hits the surface. And this is what causes these unique color shifts. Now here's the thing, to create this effect intentionally, one would require an understanding of particle size, light behavior, and metallurgy that modern science only began to unravel in the 20th century. Yet this cup was made in the fourth century and predates the discovery of modern nanotechnology by about 1,600 years. So this is a happy accident, perhaps, or a lost branch of material science. Well, when we begin to connect the dots, rather than treating each of these anomalies as if they were in a vacuum on their own, you begin to realize that you know, it's not just one example or two examples or, or three examples of some form of high technology. There's actually countless examples from ancient computational systems and archaic batteries to potential nanotechnology. The list continues on. <clears throat> Like this next one, for example, this is very interesting, Roman concrete, specifically a certain variant of Roman concrete that has self-healing properties and becomes stronger over time. The standard concrete that we use in modern construction doesn't hold a candle to this far older and more fascinating methodology. Excuse me. <clears throat> Get a little bit of water here. <clears throat> Yes, this far older and far more fascinating methodology that was deployed by the Romans. But in my opinion, I would argue that the, uh, the Romans did not uh, discover this. It was more likely, um, sorry, the Romans did not invent this. It was more likely a discovery as they raided and conquered the old world and gathered knowledge from times long before their own history began, much of which I would say is now safely tucked away in places like the uh, apostolic archives of the Vatican Church. This uh, concrete, known as Opus Cementicium, contains a unique blend of volcanic ash, lime, and seawater. But what truly makes it extraordinary is a natural process called pozzolanic reaction. Over time, especially in marine environments, this mix doesn't just resist decay, it actually grows crystalline structures that reinforce the concrete sealing cracks and regenerating its own structural integrity. So in short, it gets stronger as it gets older, it gets stronger as it gets damaged. Modern scientists only recently began to uncover how aluminum to bemerite and philipsite crystals form inside this ancient mix, creating a self-strengthening matrix. Now it was only in 2023 that scientists over at MIT were able to recreate this concrete in modern times. But even still, they had to use a synthetic variant. They, they could not replicate the exact recipe that the Romans were utilizing. So what does that tell us? Either that the Romans stumbled upon this by chance and mastered its use through trial and error, or perhaps they inherited this technique from a much earlier civilization with a deeper more intuitive knowledge of material science. And uh, we should now move on to something else that the Romans are attributed for, but I will argue until I'm blue in the face on this issue that there is no way that first century Romans were capable of what you're about to see. Baalbek, Lebanon, the stone of the pregnant woman. 
weighing around 1,100 tons of pure limestone. Absolutely colossal in scale. In the same quarry, we have the Stone of the South. This one weighs in at about 1,242 tons of Jurassic limestone. And then we have what is called the third stone. This is, in fact, the heaviest megalithic block ever quarried. And it weighs in at around 1,650 to 1,800 tons. Now, it's hard to imagine what the intended purpose of these blocks could have been. And admittedly, these blocks never left the quarry site. However, 500 meters up the road, give or take, is a site that mainstream archaeologists and historians have assigned to first century Romans, the Temple of Jupiter. Now, it's certainly true that much of this temple was constructed by the Romans in the first century, but just like so many other areas around the world, whether it's Egypt or Peru or anywhere in between, what we see here is, in fact, in my opinion and in the opinion of many others, an example of discovery and reconstruction. The Romans found a ruined temple and its foundations and they built their own temple upon it. And why can we say this? Well, we can say this because of the Trilithon Stone, 